Uh, I'm Martin. Uh, I'm a software architect here in the company. In the past uh, unit, pretty much everything Kafka, like it says there. And today I'll go, I'm going to talk to you uh, about how we are doing our distributed business with Kafka. Pretty much what we're going to talk about. What is Apache Kafka uh, in general? What is it good for? What uh, use cases we have here at Tesbitech? There are quite a lot. And in the end, we'll finish with um, some of our story of how we how it went, how we started, what uh, troubles we went through, and so on. Now a bit about the modern online business, such as ours, the online gambling business, is distributed, be it for DR, like having multiple locations because uh, one of them failing is pretty much killing your business, or just for the presence, like uh, you have customers in Asia, you have customers in the USA, you want to be close to the customers, you distribute your business. You have multiple data centers, multiple cloud locations, and so on. The model business lo hates losing its data. Like if you lose a bet in our case, it's quite a mess. If you lose a payment, another mess. It can uh, cause you issues like uh, regulatory problems and uh, at the least losing customers. And last but not the least, the business needs its data now. The, in our case, the odds should travel as fast as possible to the customers, just because wrong odds are really uh, free bets for the customers and we're losing money. Now, a bunch of Kafka. What it is, it's a software developed initially in LinkedIn, used to send messages from the so-called producers and consumed by consumers, other applications. It's an open source project under Apache. Uh, it's available as an open source product and as an enterprise offering with uh, additional support from a company called Confluent, which are people that, that originally worked at uh, LinkedIn, but uh, spinned off and created a separate company supporting Apache Kafka. And last but not the least, Kafka is a distributed transaction work. Meaning you write to it and later at some point you read uh, whatever you wrote there as a consumer. Come on. <laughs> now a bit about the vocabulary, what we're going to talk about. So we're familiar. Cluster, a group of Kafka brokers. Kaf Kafka broker is pretty much the application. Uh, the Kafka application, a topic. It's a logical grouping of messages. Pretty much, let's say you have a payments uh, topic or a notes topic or a selections topic, something like this. Uh, topics by themselves are split into partitions. Partitions are different uh, groupings of uh, messages based on something. Uh, but the partition is also uh, the physical representation of, uh, of the topic. Like in the disk, in the server of uh, where Kafka runs, there is a special fold folder with the name of the topic and some number. It's uh, where all the messages are stored. Again, those partitions can be many. A replica, a replica is a copy of a partition, usually not sitting on the on the same. Uh, well. uh, the replicas are a copy of a partition uh, with the idea of uh, if we lose a broker, those messages are available somewhere else. We can continue reading from there or writing to there. Um, the message, the actual thing that we want to transport through Kafka, it's pretty much key value pair with uh, arbitrary, arbitrary size and uh, contents. A producer, the process that's producing messages into Kafka, respectively the consumer which consumes, they can be many, the producers can be many as well. A consumer group is um, a group of consumers that are sharing work. Let's say they're consuming from the same topic and uh, Kafka is making sure that they receive data equally. And Zookeeper, not so important, but we have to mention it, it's uh, Kafka's configuration store. With the other versions, uh, Zookeeper was uh, more important, but right now it's uh, mostly metadata. It's storing mostly metadata. Now how the producing works, let's say we want to publish a message to Kafka. The big square around uh, this is, let's say, a hypothetical Kafka cluster. 
inside it we have two uh, nodes, Kafka 1 and Kafka 2. And we have a single topic in the whole cluster called topic. The 0 and the 1 here, those are the partition numbers. Uh, so we have two partitions in the topic called topic. Uh, when a producer wants to produce messages, it picks a random partition and produces the message to the uh, broker that holds this partition. As you see, in this case, this is the simplest uh, way to partition messages, pretty much uh, round robbing. Uh, one message goes to topic uh, one, to topic zero, and the other one goes to topic one, etc. So uh, this way, the data is balanced between the two brokers, and uh, consumers, in this regard, can read from both. They don't put the vote on a single broker. Uh, the, the whole process here is controlled from the producer. Kafka is not involved in any way in choosing where to publish the message to. The producer is the one choosing where to publish the message, meaning the, the producer library. Uh, now, respect to the consuming. Uh, as I said in the beginning, Kafka is a walk. Uh, messages are written to a topic and then read at some point. They, they're not, it's not like a queue where you take the message and the message disappears from there, it, it stays there. Uh, what the consumers do is they, they have an offset of uh, mark, pretty much marking where they were in the, uh, as a position in the topic when they read something, they remember this offset, and uh, if for some reason they stop, they can continue from this offset at some point later in time. Uh, you can have multiple consumers to the same topic, be it in the same consumer group or a different consumer group. Um, if, if they have a, the same consumer group, they pretty much share the topic. So one uh, consumer will receive uh, one half of the messages and another one will receive the other half. If we have uh, different consumer groups, they pretty much, we pretty much have a, a fan out where all the consumers consume all the messages. Uh, the speed of which the consumers consume the messages may be different. They don't have to consume the messages at the same speed. Uh, if one of them is slower, fine. The Kafka is not loaded at all. But this is because, uh, again, it's just a walk. It's not allocating different memory for this particular consumer or, or another. It's, uh, the data is there. The only thing that Kafka has, that has to remember is the offset where the consumer is. Again, most of the operations here are managed by the client itself. Kafka is kind of passive in the consuming process. Uh, and it's not pushing data to customer, to clients. The clients are requesting data. They are pulling uh, for data every I don't know, one, one second or a configurable amount of time. And Kafka is making sure to send as much data as possible. Uh, again, Kafka is a walk, so we write uh, data to the walk, but uh, this data can't really grow infinitely. We're going to run out of space. So Kafka has uh, two retention strategies, meaning how it treats, uh, how it uh, cleans up old data. One is really simple, it's just uh, deleting the old data. Anything that's older than one day, for example, is getting dropped by Kafka. The other one is compaction, which is very interesting. It's, as I mentioned in the beginning, every message has a key. It's a key value pair. Uh, this key is used uh, to preserve only the latest version of a particular message containing this key. Kafka is pretty much trying to, uh, whenever we send a message to Kafka with, a, with the same key, Kafka is trying to keep only the latest one. Uh, this pretty much allows us to mimic tables. Table or a cache where the, the key of the message is the primary key of the table and the value is all the rest of the columns. Uh, those two retention strategies can be combined. So those two retention strategies can be combined. So we have uh, tables, for example, something like a table that uh, has date expiration. Again, very important with the compaction. Uh, Kafka doesn't delete the old values for a particular key immediately. It just tries to keep the latest value, but when does it happen? It's, uh, it's not really defined. 
you can uh, configure Kafka to be more aggressive on this, but again, it's uh, best effort approach. Uh, something else really important, which is really helping us making the whole thing distributed, is Mirror Maker. It's a small application uh, which mirrors data between uh, two Kafka clusters, taking a topic from one Kafka cluster in one location, for example, and push, pushing it to another one. Uh, it's uh, in the simplest uh, explanation possible, it's just a consumer and a producer pair. You have a consumer consuming from one, one side and producing it to the other. Uh, for various reasons, uh, Mirror Maker is usually run on the destination side. There are several reasons why. For example, one is uh, that uh, messages can be duplicated, lost, or uh, or both, actually. But uh, we shouldn't really go into details on this. So this is pretty much the whole deal with uh, Mirror Maker. It's copy, it copies messages from one topic in uh, one cluster to the same topic in another one. Uh, now some limitations and constraints of, of the architecture of Kafka. Uh, message order is guaranteed only in the on the partition level. Me, uh, the consumer consuming the same uh, one topic is not guaranteed to receive the messages in the same way that the producer produced them, because they go to different uh, different partitions. Those partitions are consumed by the consumer at different speeds and uh, pretty much in parallel. Order is not guaranteed, but inside the partition, order is guaranteed. So if uh, if we consume from a single partition, we're going to receive the messages in the same order as the producer produced them. The number of the consumers in a consumer group can't be more than the number of partitions. The consumer consumes from a consumer in a consumer group consumes only from a single partition of this uh, of the topic that's being consumed. Uh, Multiple consumers in, a, in the same consumer group can consume the same topic because, again, the off, there is an offset that uh, uh, the consumer remembers and keeps track of. It's uh, incrementing this offset and reading messages from there. Uh, if we have uh, more consumers than, uh, than partitions in a particular topic, the excess of the uh, of the consumers wouldn't be consuming anything. They would be sitting idle until there is a, for example, one of the uh, consuming consumers die and they are assigned uh, a work there, so they can, they, they can consume. Uh, if you want to scale our work horizontally, in this case it pretty much means that we need to add more partitions to the topic. If we have a one, one partition in a topic, uh, we are pretty much limited to one consumer. If we want to scale this out, we have to change the partitioning of the, of the topic and add more, which is doable, it's there, and what uh, kind of hard. Let's say if we add a partition to, additional partition to a topic, it would be empty and the other one would, would contain everything up to this point. So there are some consideration that needs to be taken care of in this case. Uh, the number of partitions in a topic is not unlimited. Mm. As mentioned before, the partition itself is a kind of a file or a group of files in uh, on the file system, so it can't really go to an unlimited value. Like we can't have a one million partitions on top. More partitions introduce additional latency. If we have uh, ten partitions in a topic, a consumer consuming all of those uh, partitions would uh, force Kafka to be just because of the way that Kafka uh, works and sends messages to consumers, uh, it would introduce a lot of work for it. Kafka is trying to group as much as messages as, as much messages as possible before sending it to, cons to a consumer. This means that uh, if we have uh, a lot of uh, partitions in the topic, it would have to wait uh, more time for all the partitions to have some message to, to send to the consumer. Uh, yeah, if you want to, for some reason, partition uh, a topic excessively, we may have to add uh, 
uh, more nodes in the cluster because of the first limitation. It's uh, again, it's uh, it will be limited, limited just on the operating system level. In general, newer versions of Kafka are set to support. Uh, uh, there was one example with uh, 200,000 partitions per, per cluster with 15 nodes in the cluster. Again, depending on the needs, uh, this has to be uh, thought of. Now the use case at SBTEC. Uh, this is uh, more or less summary of uh, what we have as a production deployment. We have a, well, let's call it central or main location yeah. where, where we have uh, sports data originating from, for example. Uh, not only sports data, uh, data that's, uh, let's say sports content. For example, dots on the site. Uh, we have remote, uh, remote locations in various uh, countries and continents, for example, US. Uh, we have several in Europe, and uh, the main one is in Dublin. Uh, those uh, locations are responsible for local data, uh, serving uh, part of the clients, and uh, they're aggregating their data there, for example, bets, or payments, or logins, or whatever. This data eventually, in some cases, has to be mirrored to the main location. Uh, the first use case, uh, centralized logging. Uh, our system is highly distributed. If we have around I don't know, 200, 300 types of services, to the, number, the number of instances of those services is probably goes to 1,000 or 2,000. All of them are logging messages. In uh, an average day, we have around 1 billion log messages per day. Uh, all of this is fed into an Elasticsearch cluster of managing around uh, 40 terabytes of data. Uh, and, uh, and you understand it's actually, you're looking at this every day. The, uh, going uh, to 10 different machines to find your works is kind of nasty. The works has to be centralized. And losing works is kind of bad. We, it's really nice when you have an incident, it, you can't really understand what's going on because you don't have the box. So what uh, we do in our case, we have uh, our apps producing box with uh, writing to an HTTP endpoint. Uh, this HTTP endpoint is persisting the box to Kafka as fast as possible. And then we have a standard TOK uh, stack that's uh, reading from this Kafka and indexing uh, works to Elasticsearch, which can later be viewed at, uh, with Kibana. Uh, the good thing here is uh, that Kafka is in the middle. If, uh, if, for example, we have a huge spike in works, Kafka would absorb all those works and uh, we wouldn't overload the TOK stack. Uh, at some point, the spike will be absorbed, and all, all those uh, works will be visible in Kibana. Uh, another use case, really important one, the cache synchronization. We have a lot of sports data. This is just an example. We have a lot more uh, data types, but uh, this is an interesting one. It's produced at the central location, the main one. And this data has to reach the remote location, the remote locations, where it's read by pretty much all the applications. Uh, the picture here, we include Mirror Maker. Uh, we have, a, let's say this is the, um, the main location where we have a Kafka cluster serving local clients. Uh, we have some databases and uh, feed applications which are reading data from various sources like the database or some other feeds and producing data to Kafka. Then if we have some applications that are consuming from this Kafka, uh, they consume, uh, the applications inside the main location consume directly from uh, this, let's call it main Kafka. Uh, Mirror Maker in uh, this case is uh, copying the messages to local clusters to all the DC1, DC2, DC3 remote uh, locations, where we have other applications which are consuming uh, the messages only from their local Kafka. They don't go directly to the uh, main one. 
Uh, the good thing in this case is that if for some reason something happens with the networking, like this here is Dublin and this here is the US, no, it's in internet, networks fail from time to time, uh, we wouldn't have connectivity between the two, messages data would uh, get told, but in most of the cases this can be ignored. Uh, applications can work with all data for, for a while, hopefully until the connectivity is restored and we uh, get uh, back on track with, uh, with the data. Uh, the applications don't really understand there is a problem with the network. They don't fail, they, uh, they continue working in the, in the way they were working before that, just with a bit uh, stale data. Uh, another use case, the data aggregation. Uh, we have a lot of data produced at the, those remote locations. For example, bets. Uh, clients in US are generating, uh, for example, they're, they're generating uh, data in, um, in a local database. This data has to be moved to some other place for uh, some analytics or whatever, just storing. Uh, the, the nature of the of the way the bets are produced and they're coming, it's pretty much, it's pretty spiky. We have, uh, uh, if we have a big game where something really interesting happens, like the, uh, the losing team actually changes the, the course of the game and uh, people start jumping on the, placing the bets on it and so on, we pretty much have to absorb it. Uh, we shouldn't really deny bets. Losing bets, again, this is losing business. Any decline bet, any lost bet after, after it's being placed is uh, pretty problematic. Be it from a regulatory standpoint or just uh, the customer not getting his money, it's really bad. The picture here is pretty similar to the one with the cache synchronization, just in reverse. We have the remote locations, data produced by the applications there to Kafka, then consumed by possibly applications in the same location or just stored some database. We have the main location where we run Kafka as well with uh, other applications and Mirror Maker in the middle. Uh, the same considerations apply here as with the cache, cache synchronization. Mm. Now, yeah, those are pretty much the use cases. Now some story, how we started what we went through. Uh, we started using Kafka in somewhere around early 2017. The version at the time was uh, 0 0.10. Uh, right now the current latest version is I think uh, 2.1. I think it's 2.1, yes. Uh, all the code, our current uh, Quester is on version 1.1, 1 .1, uh, which was released sometime uh, last year, and pretty much between the start and uh, going to version 1.1, 1 .1, we hit all the nasty issues uh, that there were in the, uh, in the Kafka product. Like uh, Kafka brokers dying because of an out of memory uh, exception, or like this was happening for various reasons. Again, bugs in the broker. Uh, losing messages in some cases, um, and other stuff, like uh, we pretty much hit all the nasty stuff. Uh, all of the upgrades from start to finish were done in place without any downtime. downtime. Uh, we went from version 0 0.10 to 0 0.11 and then to from 0 0.11 to, 0 point, uh, to 1 without anybody, anybody knowing about it. Um, some observations on operating Kafka. Most of the maintenance, like the upgrades mentioned in the previous slides, can be done without any uh, downtime. Just we just make sure that we have enough uh, replicas in uh, for a partition. Uh, clients don't really care if a broker is stopped; they find another 
they find uh, the, for the next replica of the partition and start consuming from there or producing there. When the stopped broker can, comes back, they continue working with the, with, uh, with the one that just came back. Uh, this actually applies to like failures and so on, not just uh, scheduled maintenances. If a broker dies for some reason, like those out of memory errors and whatever, if the broker dies, applications usually recover in uh, several seconds and uh, continue working just like they were working before. Uh, Kafka scales really well. As an example, in, the, in our main location, we have three brokers serving around a thousand consumers, consuming all the caches without uh, any noticeable latency. Uh, we usually tend to create uh, dedicated clusters for the more special and critical uh, use cases, uh, just because uh, those use cases rely on special defaults or uh, we just want to reduce the risk. We don't want to mess with the betting flow because we mess something with some cache, for example. Again, this is uh, this is just a decision. It, nothing really stops us from having one big cluster that serves all the use cases. Um, partitions are sticky. They're just files sitting on the somewhere on the server where Kafka works. Uh, when, for example, we add a new broker in a cluster, because this is possible as well, unless we do, unless we move this partition or assign it to a different uh, uh, broker, it sits there and the new broker doesn't do anything. And uh, consumers don't even understand about it. So this is uh, kind of a limitation with Kafka because there is no embedded uh, mechanism that uh, uh, that helps with balancing uh, partitions around uh, brokers. There are paid solutions, there are some open source solutions that uh, can help with this, but uh, or it, it can even be done manually. But uh, this is really kind of a problem with Kafka. Um, we're finishing with uh, what we're mostly looking at for a good and healthy prediction cluster. ISR are a really important uh, metric, abbreviation of in-sync replicas, pretty much shows the state of uh, replication of a, a particular par partition. Uh, this is usually should be equal to the, um, to the number of replicas you have in a particular topic. If it goes below this value, then something is uh, either slowed down, slowed down in the network or uh, some, bro some broker is having a hard time uh, replicating the data. Uh, this is kind of fine in most cases, unless it goes to zero, where in which case uh, we wouldn't even be able to produce messages. So this is, I would say, the most important metric there is. Uh, another important thing, the in and out message rate, pretty much what, so how many messages go into the cluster and how, mes how many messages go out. Uh, this can, the, as an example, in our case, in the, with the caches, uh, the outgoing messages in the cache cluster is something around, in peak times, like 100,000 messages per second. Uh, usually looking at uh, any variations in the message rate is uh, more than enough to identify any, any issues. Uh, something else not, not so much related to Kafka, but to, to the consumers, is the consumer work. This is pretty much the difference between the offset of the, of a messy, uh, the, offset, the last offset of a partition uh, minus the offset of a particular consumer. Let's say we have 100 messages in a topic uh, with a single partition. Uh, and the consumer that reached the 50th message, the lag in this case would be 50. If this grows without stopping, then there is some, something wrong with the consumer. Either it can't keep up uh, because the data is too much, or 
it's just stuck on something. So this has to be monitored, but this is usually not a problem with Kafka, it's a problem with uh, consumers. Uh, fetch and produce serving time. This is pretty much the time it takes Kafka to process uh, pull messages, uh, pull uh, requests and uh, produce requests. Fetch, fetch, produce, they're, they're pretty much the same. In Kafka terminology, it's fetch. Uh, if this time grows, again, this, uh, uh, this may be related to uh, the fact that we have uh, too many consumers or too many producers or uh, just uh, something happens with the Kafka server. Uh, having a value of, for example, one second for produce is fine as long as it doesn't deviate. If we have, if we have huge deviations of this, then something is wrong. Um, fetch and produce purgatory sizes. The purgatory is Kafka's mechanism of uh, handling pending requests. It's just a list or a collection of uh, requests that uh, hold pending requests. Uh, such requests are not only fetch and produce, but those are the most important ones. Uh, if this grows, it's kind of related to the serving time. Uh, having a higher serving time would lead to higher, uh, higher purgatory sizes. And this may, this may mean that there is a problem. In most cases, just uh, looking at the evasion again doesn't... Uh, having, having a big uh, purgatory size doesn't mean that there is an issue. The deviation is the problem. That's pretty much it. Okay, so any questions? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> no? uh, you said you started to adopt Kafka in early 1970s. Yes, so 17. Three years ago. Uh, yeah. Is it successful or not? Are there any uh, on the market? Is it there are some alternatives now. Uh, at the time, there, there wasn't any. Like this is the pretty much the de facto streaming uh, platform that there is. Oh, so and I would say it's pretty successful because <laughs> we're all here. Like it's a, it's a huge neighbor. Like uh, we didn't have uh, uh, from no Kafka to Kafka everywhere. Like this period was something like eight months. Like. Uh, it pretty much saved us at some point. Uh, those uh, 1,000 uh, consumers, uh, the this thing is a really a good example. This is all the applications that consume any cache. The, the, our caches are everywhere, and this is our data layer. Uh, and Kafka is used as, a, as the transport. So any application that consumes a cache or some, not only caches in now, but uh, any application consuming uh, any data, it probably goes through Kafka. There are other alternatives now. There was something called Apache Pulsar, but uh, it's quite new. I think it appeared uh, 2018 or something like this. But uh, Kafka is really easy to use. Release to scale, release to operate. So I think it's a good choice. Yes. I saw that uh, consumers and partitions are like one to one, uh, the number of consumers. Yes, right? in a consumer so, loop. Uh, any new application is a new consumer. Uh, how does Kafka mm -hmm. know that uh, there is a new consumer and it must add a new partition? Mm, no, it's uh, it's kind of in reverse. The partitions are kind of static. They, you create a topic. The topic has, uh, for example, three partitions. That's it. Data is sitting inside those three partitions. The, the consumer group is kind of a client uh, notion. It, it has a client notion. The client, when requesting data, includes the consumer group in the request. So. Uh, Yes, yes. This is the kind of a unique so identifier for a consumer or a group of consumers. If we want to raise, uh, say, uh, our, we have eight nodes for our application, we need to change the default settings. And if you have... Say if I have microservice, 
which mm -hmm. you want to run like eight instances, not two, like standard. Yeah, and you have uh, three or like less than eight, uh, or, or exactly eight uh, uh, partitions, you would have to increase them. But uh, ha by the way, having uh, more partitions than uh, consumer is not a problem at all. You can have uh, 16 partitions in the topic and just one consumer. In this case, you can increase the number of uh, consumers to 16 without any problem. I mean, now when any problem. Let's say uh, someone to read a ticket, register a new topic, okay. we have by default three? Four. Uh, it's, it's three. We, we usually put three. And three replicas. Okay. Unless it's uh, specified and... Uh, so we need to request more. Yeah. If you know that you would need more, or just uh, to be sure for the f to be future proof, and uh, you think that you have to scale your services, yeah, you you would have to request more. <laughs>